Hello, Bill. Great to be here in the man cave. <laughs> this is the professional extension of the man cave. This part is a. Uh, this is where real work gets done. This is the only part in the building. It's worth it just to see it. <laughs> no, really. I I thought I was, and I did not expect this. But, you know, as I was just telling you off the air, I invited myself on this show. Yes. I. Well, you requested, I, and I, I did. I, I, I would have invited we're, you. We're doing. We're coming back on the air. Real time's coming back in a few days, and we always do something to promote it. I was let's let's do that show. You know, I like that show. Why can't I do the shows I listen to? Wow. Got that in Mexico. You should put that in a. Uh, it looks like it should be a ring. <laughs> For <laughs> Maybe a, if for a, for slash a, a roadie <laughs> for a roadie. Yeah. What you, what season are you guys coming into? Oh fuck! Um, <laughs> I don't know seasons. It's hard to. Yeah, I could just go by years. We started on HBO in two thousand three, but then we used to do. For the first few years, they had us do two seasons. They took us took them a while to get the idea that this is not like The Sopranos or any other show. This kind of show is a habit show. It has to be on most of the year. We used to do a season from February to like May, and then we'd be off for four months and come back for a few months in the fall. That's not the way you can do it when you're following events, a live show. Right. So finally, somewhere in there, they just, okay, so then it was one long season as opposed to two. So I guess they counted the early years as two. We've been on HBO since 2003, but of course, I started... You were on the old show, Politically Incorrect. Somebody sent me a clip of that. Wow. I couldn't even bear to watch it just from the way we looked. <laughs> it was too sad. Time is cruel. It, it, it's <laughs> Actually, we look better now just because we look douchier. <laughs> uh, younger, of course. I mean, that's the trade-off in yes. life is that you're douchier when you're younger. Yeah. But you do look more pristine, shall we say. You're um, less beaten down by time. Yeah. But that started in 93, so I've already passed wow. my, we did a 25th anniversary show uh, about a year and a half ago. Yeah, in the fall of 18 it aired. Um, I couldn't believe that. Do you know they're trying to bring back Politically Incorrect? Who is they? Whoever the fuck they are, I, they came to me. Ri- they, yeah. that's, that's so funny because I suggested that a while ago, with it, not with me hosting it, of course, but with somebody else hosting it. But... I'll have to ask my manager about that. I thought we, I guess we sold it. <laughs> I, I, I think that's true. When we moved to ABC, it must be ABC. When we moved to ABC, I think we probably sold them the rights to the show, which is was probably stupid, but at the time it made sense. And Well, good luck with it. I'm not doing it. <laughs> it was kidding. one of those questions no. that my, my manager calls me up and says, you're not going to want to do this, but I'm obligated to tell you. Why wouldn't you want to do it? It just doesn't seem like something I'd want to do. No, I'm insulted. No. I'm just kidding. I would never want to take over your show after I know, you exactly, did it, and then exactly. you got it stripped away for no, no, saying something. The, the whole thing was, like, you, once someone does a show, leave it alone, you know? Right. Leave it to yeah. under moment. Yeah, if, like if you left and they started doing real time with Adam Carolla, right? You know, which is exactly what they will be doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's just you come up with a new fucking show, you know? Right. Do you feel constrained by the time, by the the hour format? Uh, sometimes I was uh, on with Howard Stern recently, and I was saying that to him, and I feel the same sometimes when I watch or listen to you. Um, it's it's funny, Ameri- I don't get America. Like people's attention span is either seven seconds or three hours. Yeah, <laughs> there's no in, there's no in between. Well, uh, there's a lot of us. That's what it is. This this a idea, lot of people. Yeah, they're yes, playing exactly. to the people with the shortest attention span. Right. They say this is all they have. This right. is all that's there. That's not right. true. But no. it takes a big risk to play right. to the three hours. I mean, there are virtues and vices to both of them. I mean, I do like. Um, being forced to condense. Uh, and for people, I always think of the person watching my show as the person who is interested in current events but doesn't have the time to follow it during the week. They've got kids and jobs and lives. They are going to watch me to catch them up. Uh, and it's my job to obviously entertain them 
but also to point out what's important. What what happened this week that you should know about? Somewhere in that live hour, whether it's in the monologue or in new rules or the editorial I do at the end or in the panel, somewhere I want to cover everything I think you should know. doesn't necessarily mean it's the things that the newspaper or other outlets thought was important. What I think is really important, that's what I'm going to cover. So there is something to be said for condensing. There's also a lot to be said for letting it breathe. You know, I mean, letting it breathe, I do miss that sometimes. I wish I could. And very often we're in the middle of a discussion and I have to move on. But I feel like with the way things are going now with streaming, like I know HBO has their new streaming service. Right. Maybe they could just give you a, an option to let some some of those conversations lengthen out. It just seems like some right. of them you're just getting started and you have to cut them off. You're right. And again, sometimes people just want the headlines. Very often I'm reading something and it's too long. I just think, you, just, you should have given me, the New York Times starts every article, uh, not, just tell me what happened. Yeah. Don't give me the background and on a rocky road in Afghanistan, mm. as Fran Leibowitz once said, and remember, just get to the part I care about. Right. I, um, movies are too long. Lots of stuff is too long. People need editors. But these kind of conversations lend themselves more than most art forms to just letting it happen. And yeah, it's more natural. I mean, I like the fact that unlike my early days when you'd sweat backstage and you'd hear the Tonight Show band playing and it's like, mm, you know, Johnny's going to ask you this and then you're going to say that and you're going to do this and don't fucking veer from this. You get in trouble and this is good. I didn't prepare anything. Yeah. You know, obviously you didn't prepare anything. No, no. I'm kidding. <laughs> I did. <laughs> you really have no list of questions? No, no. So I know what you. I like you. Right. I, I, well, I would, I'm sure I'm not going to run out of things to ask you or talk to you about. But that's a talent in itself that you could do that off the top of your head. I, I, I think you think it's not that much of a talent. But trust me, a lot of people could not do that. I don't know if I would trust myself. If you said, you have two hours with this guy, I, I, would, I would, it would be in the back of my mind like, shit, what if... An hour and 10 minutes in, I'm like, fuck, I can't think of one more thing. I can't imagine if you and I were at dinner together for right. two hours, we'd run out of shit to talk about. That's probably true. So that's this. Okay. It's the same shit. Followed by dead air. Watch. It's <laughs> complete dead air. <laughs> Listen, man, I've been a fan of yours for a long time. I bought True Story. And I have you. Wow. wow yeah, man, I bought that it, book way it. back in the day, man. I, I was living in New York. It was a great book. Thank that's you. a I very underrated it. book on stand-up comedy. I appreciate comedy. that. Yeah, it's a novel. Yeah. You know, it's a novelization of my early life. Very accurate, though. Like, it's you could feel like you lived the life, and you know, the, yeah. the names were hilarious of the, yes. the characters you chose. No, I, I worked probably harder on that than almost anything I've ever done. I would never really? Really? And, yeah, I would never write another novel. Well, just to to make every <clears throat> sentence, every paragraph f funny or telling, no extra words. To me, that's the kind of what year did you write that? I it's funny. I started it in the early '80s when I was still almost living it, and I would get busy and put it aside, not look at it for years, and then uh, I did a. <laughs> this is my old life. In 1985, in December, I went down to uh, see Watanejo, Mexico, to do the memorable TV movie. TV movie. There, there's a phrase that dates you. The f f memorable TV movie Club Med. I think we all remember it. No, we don't. Linda Hamilton was the star. I think I do remember it. I th hope you don't. I remember Linda Hamilton. Okay. In, in a movie. Yes. Right. With you. <clears throat> now I'm, I'm picturing okay. it. It was a TV movie. Um, and, uh, we stayed at the club med. Um, I was in, you know, it was kind of a low budget thing as far as the people in the cast and crew went, because we stayed at the club med, which was not a club med is not a luxury hotel. You know what club meds are. You, you, you give up your money, you pay everything in beads, but you don't really need money. And the room, for people who just, you're going to enjoy the outside. That's why you're in Mexico. So the room is monastic, right? There's no TV because you're out all day. You know, you're just going to be in the waves and then you're going to fuck and go to sleep and whatever. 
So I had a lot of free time because I wasn't in the shot every day, but I was in Mexico. Eventually, I got fucking cabin fever down there. You know, I couldn't wait to get home. But I was there a long time and had nothing to do, and I wrote a lot of the novel there. And I put it away again. And then I was in a real career slump in the early 90s. I had finished with acting mostly. I didn't want to do that anymore. I'd done a few sitcoms, and I didn't want to be the office creep forever. And so I was just like nowhere. And that's when I finished it. And also, that's like the year I did cocaine, (laughs) which I probably would not have finished it without that. It was only one year? It was one year. I was never meant to do cocaine. When everyone was doing it, I never wanted it. You know me. I'm a pothead like you. It's not my drug. But, you know, if you really insist, <laughs> you, can get in, you can get into any drug. And I, and I just happened to be at this point in my life where I was vulnerable to any – I had nothing to do all day. I wasn't working. So uh, – and it helps you write. It it's helps a productivity you, drug. It's a productivity yeah. drug. I was, it was never a drug that I liked because I wasn't social on it. But I could – I used to like to have sex on it. Really? Most men did not. I love that. And uh, and write. But I didn't want to talk. Some people are like, you know, that, that guy. I don't. I was never that guy who did coke and talk a blue streak. No. But, but it helped me, you know, concentrate and organize and that kind of stuff. And, you know, and then I was probably smoking pot too. I was smoking cigarettes. It was not a healthy year. That was not a healthy year. I I'd, uh, I remember, you know, because cocaine, which is – kids that is the worst drug it really is because you get a little honeymoon period and then that quickly goes away and then you're chasing that high and you know it's not healthy and then you know you're you're trying to at the end of the night take the edge off you know you're into that put the edge i gotta put the edge back on i took it off too much by drinking jack daniels ah damn now i gotta take it off again i put it on too much it's uh, that was i never touched it I got lucky. You, you very yeah. smart. It's I horror, would have probably horrible. really enjoyed it. I think I would have really enjoyed it. Yeah, that's probably why I didn't. De- I, at the, at the, again, at the beginning. Yeah, it's very much like a relationship. Cocaine, good at the <laughs> beginning. You know, <laughs> I think trails off. <laughs> yeah, you know, I always say that because resentment. Towards there the is end. a time when relationships are good. Spoiler alert: It's the beginning. <laughs> for a lot of them, for sure. Yeah. Now, when you put that book out, um, is it still in publication? Another great question. I'm finding so much about my own life here. I didn't know because the comics incorrect was being redone. Um, comics from my era, like guys who grew yeah, up and sure. got a hold of that book yeah, when, yeah. when we were just starting yeah. out. There was a, it was huge. A lot of guys passed it around. A lot of guys talked yeah. about it. Hey, you got to get this book. Yeah. No, I mean, and I tried to make it into a movie. Uh, there was many scripts written. I mean, it's my own fault for not pushing that through. I guess, but I thought. At the time, it would really would have made a a good movie, but it's probably too late now. And well, I, you definitely have to change the names it, now. It's very hard. Yeah, <laughs> I did in the script. It's very yeah. It's very hard to depict stand up comedy in a movie. In fact, one of the original impetus to write the book was that no one was doing that well. I remember that movie came out with Tom Hanks. Remember that? Punchline. Yeah. Punchline, okay. And Tom Hanks was good. I mean, Tom Hanks could could have been a stand-up yeah. comic. He did it as good as you can. Passable. Passable. But they just never capture the no. whole essence of it. And also, when you're trying to have someone... I see this on... Um, Maisel? No, I haven't seen that yet. Some show... Oh, the one... I think it's Jim Carrey's show on Showtime about... Oh, I'm dying up here? Thank yeah. you, yes. And uh, I, I like the show, but whenever you're showing a stand-up comic and you're f- and it's acting, you're acting as a stand-up, and then the audience right. has to laugh, yeah. there's something about it that isn't, it just, you can tell it's not real. It's like a boxing Be- scene in a movie, same thing. A little bit. Yeah. Yes. Rocky. Right. Yeah. But that's sometimes purposely over the top. This just comes off as fake because one thing we love about comedy is that laughter is involuntary yeah it's in you can't as any giant comedy star knows you can walk out at a comedy club and you'll get the biggest ovation in the world two minutes later you can be dying because 
it's involuntary. Yeah. Yes, they're thrilled to see you, but then if you don't say something funny, they can't. They're not going to laugh. It's also uh, a very uniquely live th- thing. It's yeah. like you have to be uh, right. I always say that like if you watch a special on TV, you're really you're getting sixty percent of the funny. You're right. You have to be there live. You if you're there live, you'll get a hundred percent of it. So not only that, not only are you watching it not live, right? Because you've got a recording of it, but now it's also a fake recording. So it's a guy pretending to be on stage and an audience pretending yeah. to be an audience, and the whole thing is yeah. a disaster. Yeah, so maybe it's a blessing in disguise <laughs> that it they never got made into a movie. They do a pretty decent job of capturing the the marvelous Mrs. Maisel does of capturing like the early scene in clubs, like of her going up drunk and talking shit, and then people telling her like you you could probably do comedy. Like it seems chaotic and real, but it, it gets a little less realistic as time goes on. But, but you watch that show and yeah, you like it. Yeah, I like the first two seasons. The third season, I'm like, I hope they're not losing me here. And it takes place in the fifties. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would watch something like that, except there's just too much. First of all, there's just too much. Too many yes. things to watch. Yeah. I mean, I put it on my list, but, you know, I'm going to get to that. And does everything have to be like a season? You know, right. does everything have to be so drawn? Like back to our subject. Everything mm-hmm. is either very condensed or way too drawn out. And you have to follow it. It's and you not to, like an yeah. episode of Friends where you don't have to know what the fuck happened the week before. And you can just tune in. The Seinfeld yes. is not dependent upon the week before. Right. It's, all everything's shows. an arc. Yeah, and, everything and, is. And people binge. I don't binge. I, I've never binged anything. I, I have the opposite problem. I have watching ADD. I, when I, I love to watch TV. It's the last thing I do before I sleep at night. Um... But unless something is absolutely compelling, I don't watch more than 15 minutes of it. I'll watch 15 minutes of this and then 15 minutes of that and 15 minutes of something else thing and then go to sleep. You know, people are structuring their Netflix specials that way because of that. People are doing their closing bit first. I read that somewhere that yeah. you have to well, you have to grab them. Yeah. That's why every fucking drama is something and then six months earlier. Yeah, you know we have to go back because you have to grab them first, and then, <laughs> and it's such a tired trope now. Yeah. You know, it's like now that we've seen it a hundred times, think of something else, or just go really crazy and do something linear. Well, it's you know this whole thing that you were saying before. We either have a second, uh, seven second attention span, or we have three hours. I I would love to see someone try to make a movie like Steve McQueen's Le Mans. Because if you don't remember that movie, the old Steve McQueen. Yeah, the old Steve McQueen. There's no (laughs) kids. There was a Steve McQueen before the very talented director. Oh, I didn't even know there was a director, Steve McQueen. Yes, you do. Who is he? Was he do? He he directed. What you know, right? You heard him. He directed. He's an African American. He directed Twelve Years a Slave, I believe. Oh, okay. Are you uh, are you using your magic light box to Google him? And what Directors else did he ever. direct? He's a big director. He's he's a major major guy. Mm. That's Steve McQueen. Oh, there he goes. I didn't know who he is. Um, Shame, hunger. Widows. Yes, widows. he just did Widows. Never saw that. Um, widows, twelve years. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I anyway, remember the old Steve the actor, McQueen too. The actor yes, Steve the, McQueen, the um, one who died of cancer yeah. in 1980, I believe. I remember him chasing cures in Mexico. Poor oh, guy. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Lung cancer. Uh, I think probably. I think he probably was a heavy smoker, and oh. um, but yeah, he was. Uh, he was. What about him? The movie Le Mans is a really yeah. slow beginning. There's no talking for like the first. I don't know how many minutes. It's just you know people going about their life on the racetrack, like all preparing for things. And oh, there's no chat. Oh, you ever try to watch a Hitchcock movie? Oh yeah, same thing. Yeah. I mean. It just shows how different the audiences mm-hmm. are and how we have developed or undeveloped. Well, or- I don't know if it's that or if it's that there's an expectation that people have a short attention span and so that everything is made for that expectation. No, they do. They do. <laughs> I think they I do think they really do. I mean the more you I do. I, I I must say, as someone who grew up when Alfred Hitchcock was still was he still making? Yeah, he made a movie in 1972. I was 16. I saw it in the theater. It was one of his last. He was on his last legs. But Psycho had, was 1960. 
I was too young to, for that. But he, he was still very in vogue and a, a big director. And I tried to watch, um, I did watch the one he made in 1956, the year I was born, called um, The Man Who Knew Too Much, I think. Mm. It's a story he made three times. Uh, he liked that story about the innocent guy who's being chased by somebody and he doesn't know why they're chasing him and the police are after him, but he's he's got to find the bad guys before the police find him. It's Jimmy Stewart and Doris Day. It is, I mean, they talked about the master of suspense. I mean, Jesus Christ, it was like the master of keeping me from falling asleep. Uh, it's really subtle, slow, uh, I'm sorry, but I think they've improved on that. I did, maybe that's sacrilege to the movie community, and Martin Scorsese will write me a letter or something. But Jesus Christ, I'd much rather watch Salt. Hmm. You know, there's a thriller that right. moves, or the Jason Bourne. Mm -hmm. Those movies, I feel like they took what Hitchcock was doing, and yes, they revved it up, and I'm glad they did. Hitchcock's hard to get through. But you also have to realize when Hitchcock was making films, they've been only making films for 50 years. It was a really... Oh, even less. Yeah. I mean, he started in the late 30s. Right, right. You know, I mean, talkies yeah. had only been around for like 10 years. That's he crazy. goes way back, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's something about that, like, even when you think about stand-up, like, have you ever tried listening to Lenny Bruce? I certainly have. Good example. Yeah. I can't do it. It doesn't work anymore. It's just, uh, contextually, we're in a different world. But any of those old schoolers, yeah, that's a point. At this, uh, funny, it's it's in True Story where I talk about how those guys who are such um, icons couldn't make it today because yeah. they take too long. Mm -hmm. You could take you could take two minutes before you got to the punchline. You could take two minutes to set something up. The audience was perfectly okay with that. You could never do that today. Jack Benny mm -hmm. and Bob Hope was more rapid fire. But a lot of these old schoolers, you know, I mean, I have a never funny list. And <laughs> uh, <laughs> me and a friend of mine created years ago, and some of them are on it, you know, Danny Thomas and I don't know, yeah. Red Skelton. I, I mean, there's some people who I thought were never, Bill Cosby, I must say, was on that list. Really? Oh, yeah. You never that, thought he was funny? Never thought he was funny. Even when he was doing Bill Cosby himself, like back in the album days? And I may have missed some stuff he did, but everything I ever heard, even when I was a kid and I saw him on TV, I'm like, no. I'm like, this shit's corny. And I, I feel very, very uh, ahead of my time. I never liked him. I did. <laughs> well, it was one of those things where if you had said any of this that you're saying 10 years ago, people would have been furious at you. Well, but now that he's been exposed. I, somebody as... told me he was a creep back in 1983. Ah, okay. Um, Someone told me in '94. Yeah. yeah. So I and it was somebody I liked, not somebody I was romantically involved with, but a girl who he was horrible to, mm. and uh, I never liked him after that as a person. That not makes just, sense. Not just I had as... heard from people on the set of news radio that he drugged girls. It was like one of those it's... weird things that you heard as a room, like, "What does he do?" Yeah. He drug girls? Like Bill Cosby? Bill right. Cosby, Bill Cosby. We're talking about the same guy? Right. It's not like Steve McQueen, Steve McQueen. We'll get him confused. Right. No. No, I mean. Uh, America's yeah, dad. Yeah, America, And you have to wonder why a guy who could um, get laid. Yeah. Uh, even as a married man. Um, that's obviously a sick kink he had. But I also know uh, a guy who was a promoter and and – told incredibly ridiculous stories about things that Bill Cosby did that were not sexual, but just informed me that what his kink is is part of a much larger sickness about control yeah. and making people do weird things because he can. Let me tell you what I heard. You tell me what you heard. Okay. I heard he <laughs> makes people watch him eat curry. He would make the whole staff come into his dressing room and watch him eat. I hadn't heard that exactly, but it's exactly in line with what yeah. I heard, that he would uh, do things like make you, um, what was one of them, like he would order food and then he would say, you know, uh, scoop out the uh, <laughs> the doughy part of the hamburger bun 
after you wash your hands and put it back on the hamburger. Or once he asked them to send him the soap that he hadn't finished using in the dressing room. Like collect, send it to him. Send it to him. Yeah, just like crazy, crazy shit. That, again, speaks to a uh, pathology that's larger than what we know about him sexually. That, that fits yeah. as a subcategory under that. Because to need to have the woman be unconscious, yeah. that's, a, that's a weird thing. I can't, I can't, I can't get into I, – I, I, there's certain things I, like, I can't even imagine why someone would find it attractive Most to, to be can't. with a child. Yeah. No, it's, I can't understand why that right. would be appealing to you. I can't understand this. You know, yeah. A lot of things I can't understand. Um, I worked at a casino, and he made the security guard tuck him into bed <laughs> yeah. and shut things, the lights off. Things like He's like, I'm going to lie <laughs> on the bed, and I want you to tuck me in and shut the lights off. Like, he had like a, a whole routine that he wanted them to follow, and he wanted them to tuck him into bed. Yeah. Wow. Well, I had a friend who had an interesting take on it. And he said, there is something that happens to some famous people, particularly famous people who were famous a long time ago, where they feel like they are better than other people. That Whoa. There is a giant gap between them and other people, and they feel like they can do things to people. And they, that, that well, what, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't think that's uncommon. But his pathology. But, but most meaning, people try to hide that. <laughs> well, I think <laughs> they try to hide that feeling. They try to But I think he did present, try to hide it. You know, it's called acting. You yes. Know? Uh, that's why when they're in front of the camera, they're so charming, but we know that behind the scenes, they're, they're not. Yeah. But he seemed to wear it on his sleeve. Well, no. sort of sometimes, right? But the other thing that he was doing in public was he was trying to chastise uh, other comics for using bad words. And, you know, he, he had a lot of weird control issues with that as well. But my, my friend's take on it yes. was that he thinks that there are people that they get to this position where they think that they're owed things. And he, he thought about that sexually too. He said he probably felt like he was just so above those women that he didn't even want to negotiate with them. He just drugged them and fucked them because he's Bill Cosby and they should be happy. Yeah. I, it's crazy. It's, no, it's, it's no, I mean, the human, no, yeah. the, the human mind is the bottom of the ocean. It's mostly unexplored, <laughs> a, a giant mystery. Well, especially that kind of scenario. I mean, how many human beings have ever experienced what he's experienced? He's been famous since the 1950s. Right. He was an American icon. Right. He is rich beyond imagination. Groundbreaker. Groundbreaker. And you know. a legitimate world-class stand-up comic who toured the whole world, created yeah. this Cosby show that was a groundbreaking television show. Oh, yeah. So many factors. So many yeah. factors. And then on top of that, a psychotic pervert and a creep and drugging right. women. I mean, on top, and who knows what other, fu other fucking shit? Probably not just that. No. You know, when someone's that fucked up, it's probably not just, they might find like 30 dead cats in his backyard. Right. I mean, who knows what the fucking guy's into? <laughs> well, I, somebody told me, uh, this may not be true, that he was drugging people with animal tranquilizers. That that's he had a vet's license or something, and that's how it, that's how he was. Because people were like, how did he get the stuff that he was right. using for the knockout pills, Ugh. would this would it offend you if I put my feet? No, up? not at all. And when, okay. Why would it offend? It is me? a man. Well, it's a man, it's a man cave. cave. I don't. Put I them up there, ask buddy. It. Your, Relax. Your, it's your place. I want you to I, feel good. Yeah. I put my feet up here all the time. Oh, great! You got no. some loafers See, on I purpose. On those for... are your choice. You wore those today. I didn't even think about it. See, that's that's <laughs> why I'm saying I, I'm glad I did this because I don't have to think about oh my wardrobe and what I'm going to wear and yeah. is Johnny going to like me? <laughs> oh boy! Did you do the night show with Johnny? 30 times. Holy shit. 1982 to 1992. Wow. Yeah. 30 times. Yes, which just shows you that show was, when I, when I started to do it, there was such a proliferation of comics. that You could do that show 30 times, and that didn't make me famous. I mean, it, it elevated me to a degree. It legitimized you in show business. But... That at one point, just doing the Tonight Show once made you a star. Mm. But part of what True Story is about was the comics' frustration that they came along at a time when it wasn't that unique a thing anymore. Mm. It was too many comics. You couldn't swing a dead cat without hitting a comic. 
Well, so now. I, I, I have like in my Sirius XM uh, radio uh, in the car, the comic stations and I love them. I, I would listen, I'd very often see somebody's name. I've never heard of this comic. I'll never see it again. Uh, they're doing, you know, they play four or five minutes of their routine. It's very professional. It's funny. I'm laughing. And who is this person? This just and seemed like an innumerable supply of, of very competent stand-ups who have funny bits about the ketchup bottle. And I don't know any of them. And I guess they have followings. And <clears throat> they you obviously out, do you go work. to the clubs, though? Club? Fuck no. I haven't been to the, the clubs. It's like you go back to high school. No. I go to the high school every day. You do? Yeah. I work well, the clubs I, all yeah, the time. So does Leno and lots of uh, Seinfeld, yeah. Chris Rock. I don't get it. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know why you <laughs> want to do that. First of all, because my friends are there. I like going there and talking to the other comics that are there all the time. Wow. And uh, I like to do it because it keeps me sharp. I, I do that lineup at the store. There's 13 other comics on the list. But I work the hustling. road. I, I, I do that too. I, yeah, but yeah. I'm saying, but that's my how I keep sharp as mm-hmm. I, or as sharp as I can be uh, is, well, also I gave up on memorization years ago. First of all, with all the pot I've smoked, it just wasn't going to happen. I've used what I call the poor man's teleprompter for oh, it's got to be 20 years, which is I have a music stand on stage, and then I have my notebook which has my bullet points. And I don't think the audience even notices it after. I, I, it's very every five minutes. I'm very discreetly moving the page, and but that way I don't have to memorize anything. When I get home from the gig, I go through it. I re- redo it in the computer, print it out, and it's 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 just been the greatest thing because I can say I can get to exactly what I want to say. Mm. I hate comics who stand up there and go, "What else? What mm. else?" It's like fuck that. You should know what else. Never hear me say what else to it. I know what else, and I'm going to tell you. I'm going to try to condense it. I'm going to give you the best show I can for 90 minutes and then leave. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I mean, you certainly can do it that way. <laughs> yeah, we all have our own ways yeah, of doing it. Yeah, everybody's got their own way of doing it. Yeah, we all. I, I like to be around a lot of other comics, like a large number of very good comics all the time. I think you, you feed off each other. Like I'm, I'm on the road all the time. When I'm on the road, I'm with my friends. I, you know, I go and tour with other I know very, you do. very funny comics. Yeah. But when I'm in town, I just like to be around as many as I can. You, you should do my Hawaii gig one year. You know, I have a steady. Well, I ran into Natasha and yeah, Moshe. she did it last year. Yeah, I ran into them and Maui. I was like, "What are you guys doing?" They go, like, "Oh, we're working with Bill." My God. Oh, in Maui? Yes. You were there? Yes. I was oh. there with my family. We were just uh, well, vacationing. Next year is the tenth. It was like it was like uh, New Year's, right? Yes, I, yes. I started this ten years ago. Nobody would book it. They they all said uh, Hawaii's a dead market, and I found this promoter uh, who was like, "Okay, I'll try it." And it worked, of course. Honolulu is a big city. There, <laughs> more than a million people there. Yes, and yeah. Maui. So we do Maui on December thirtieth, and we do uh, New Honolulu Year's Eve New in Year's? Honolulu. Oh. And there's always surprises. And um, this year, Sarah Silverman did it, and Bobby Slayton, and we have some some sometimes some very well-known musicians who join us. Uh, Woody Harrelson is also in Maui and plays with us a little bit. It just, Steven it's Tyler's just, in Maui, too. Yes, I saw him there one year. Um, but maybe you'd consider slumming, and it's a great, fun trip, and you're with comics. and uh, I've never performed in Hawaii. Every time I go there, it's just to chill. Well, I'm going to hit you up on that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I stopped doing New Year's Eve shows on my own. That's the great thing about it. I always hated New Year's Eve. What a yeah. shit day. And uh, the show is at 8 o'clock. So oh, okay. We, so it's just a show. It's a regular show. Right. So you don't it's a regular. Go, right. Right. No. Exactly. Yeah. It's a regular show, 8 to 10 or maybe a little after 10. We always, the whole c- group sings Smile at the end of it. I made that a tradition, the old Charlie Chaplin Smile, though your heart is aching. You know that one? Sure. Well, you'll have to learn it. 
And, Jesus, what a weird gig. And uh, <laughs> Well, it's New Year's Eve. You got to do something as you send them off. Right, it's only right. an hour and a half left in the new year, in the old year. And I feel like that was the pro- appropriate song because it was a song written by a comedian, Charlie Chaplin. It's 100 years old. It was a hit in the 50s for Nat King Cole. Michael Jackson uh, redid it in the 90s. Uh, when he was on trial for child molestation, chose to do a song by Charlie Chaplin, the most famous child molester. <laughs> so that was Michael's way of... I Charlie guess, Chaplin was a child molester? Well, Charlie Chaplin, I think back then they didn't call it that. But yes, he married... I didn't know anything. Oh, yes, he married like... Tw- it was like Jerry Lee Lewis. He was like with 14-year-olds. Really? Charlie Chaplin, yes. I don't think I'm talking out of school about... Charlie Chaplin, can you conjure something up there you. on your magic light box, Jamie, and see if uh, uh, see if there's information <laughs> that what are we? The I audience you, I just of, didn't know. The audience says child molester. <laughs> yes, Charlie Chaplin, famous for for that, and wow. I, you know back then I don't think they got you for it, but what he, did they do? What was he, the legal age back then? Possibly none. <laughs> right. They probably didn't know a law. I, mean, I, don't, oh I don't know if they even had such a concept. I mean, we're talking about an well, era Elvis before too, right? women. They weren't letting women vote in right. the teens. They didn't, women didn't vote till 1920. I don't know if there were child labor laws. Um, I just don't know. Well, Priscilla Presley, wasn't she like 14 when Correct. Elvis? Correct. Yeah. And that was. So the, Elvis was a child molester too. And that was the 50s, right? Right. And. That well, he he went into the army in '58, so that's when he met her in Germany. Her father was a colonel, and she was 14. And of course, he was 25 and a giant Jesus rock star. Christ. And he says to the colonel, "Would you mind if I took your 14-year-old daughter back to America? She can live with me at Graceland, and it'll all be good." And the guy says, "Enjoy." <laughs> what the fuck was wrong with people back then? <laughs> Those are different human beings. So it's exactly. not just a oh, hundred years ago. No, it's... no, we're 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 so different. Just yeah. just our. I mean, I'm a little older than. Oh, what's 16-year-old. That? Harris met actor Charlie Chaplin. Sixteen is not as I, that's disgusting. That's not as even. 14. I don't think the worst one. It's of a him. famous one. As I well. mean, is there uh, like a he, Charlie Chaplin the he, pervert or child molester? Yes, that there up? definitely is. Gotta be. Um, but yes, pe- fairly people young, were but just people died young back then. I was thinking recently, people were just rougher. Yeah. You know, I mean, you and I, I think, walk the same path very often, talking about. We, I think, are progressives, but we have short patience with some of the fragile, yes. woke bullshit. Yes. Okay. And some of that is just the way you're brought up. I think kids are coddled, you know. I think uh, they're indulged, and that's the reason why they freak out over microaggressions and stuff. And some of that is just, I was telling someone this story, not, a, not apropos of this, just talking about something else, but it just reminded me that here I'm a kid who had, I think, a a normal middle class upbringing. I consider it an idyllic time. Um, I I consider it, it an innocence you couldn't buy today. I mean, first of all, I grew up in New Jersey uh, in the 60s. There was no racial issues because there was only one race in town. That's just the way it was. I'm not saying that's good. It wasn't, but that's so. There weren't racial issues. There weren't drug issues. I didn't. I didn't try pot in high school. I, I, may have, maybe there was a rumor that a few kids were doing it, but that wasn't even a thing. There wasn't even any like divorce. It was really the land that time forgot. You know, it was Leave It to Beaver land. And I was telling someone this time, my father, who grew up in the Depression. Uh, cheap. I, you know, love him dearly, but I don't think that's the wrong word. And sent us to an army friend of his as the dentist. And this is 1964. I was eight and did not use Novocaine. And I remember vividly, like he, I had like eight cavities that had to be filled. He said, if it hurts, raise your hand, you know, as the drill went into me. I was like, okay. So they're drilling into me. And then I'm riding home up this big hill. It was cold on my bike with the tears freezing on my cheek. So get to the dentist yourself. First of all, they wouldn't do that today. They don't let kids just be on their own. 
Like, get your ass to the dentist on your bike, get home after they drill into you with no Novocaine. And I'm saying, I wasn't raised by bad people. This, no. People were just rougher. Yeah. It was just a rougher time. And I, I wouldn't recommend these things exactly necessarily, although getting someplace on your own I don't think is the worst thing in the world. But uh, a little more of that. Have you ever had Jonathan Haidt on your show? Yeah. The, his book, yeah. The Coddling of the American yes. Mind, is exactly Love about it. that. And he believes that you should let your kids roam around and let, let them find their way home. And there let, is a, a movement for that. Yeah. We, I, that's how I was raised. I that's came how home, I was raised, too. came home from, yeah. from school, fly into the house, change into my play clothes, fly out the door. My mother never said, where are you going? What are you doing? Yeah. And, you know. You were gone. Yeah. And again, in Leave it to Beaver Town, there was a six o'clock whistle. Really? Yeah, at the Did firehouse. Know? The whistle went off. Time for dinner? And then you... Choo. Right. And then you got your ass home when you heard the whistle. <laughs> we didn't have watches or phones or, you know. I don't want... I mean, I don't want to compare. It, it's, a, it's a different world, for sure, between the way we grew up and the way they're growing up today. Um, I don't know what's better. I don't know which one's better. There's certainly a lot well, of whiny some of crybabies each. today. Yeah, but there's also a thing today where we're 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 giving them access to information way quicker. So there's got to be, right. and this is this is not something that's been studied, right? Like what happens to a young mind when it has access to almost anything as soon as you get a phone? You're giving twelve year olds, thirteen year olds phones, and then they have access to everything in the world, everything, porn. Any, Porn instantly. Which I, you know, you're talking to a libertine, but I do not think porn is benign. Well, I do not. It is not benign. Not the, not the, the way it is now on the computer. I mean, it's it's rapey. It's um, it's it's what a sites are you going to? Any any site. I'm not getting the rapey porn, but well, I think it's well, not it's, benign because oh please, it's not. It's not. It's domineering. Yes, it's a lot of things that I am not interested in, even in my fantasies. I was doing a, a bit about that in my last special. Like, even in my fantasies, I don't want to choke anybody. Yeah. I, I don't want to come on your face. I mean, come on, coming on your face, that that's not <laughs> rapey or domineering or, I mean, I, I find that off-putting and gross. It doesn't, that doesn't move me. And the thing, I don't get it, but that's half of what, Pornhub is well. I think what half of it is now is a lot of stepsister stuff. It's like stepfather, that, stepsister, what's stepbrother. What's that all about? Because people are trying to be naughty, and there's nothing naughty left. Because like the idea right. of porn originally was like, I can't believe these people are having sex. Like go back and watch porn from the eighties. So they're just having sex, ass fucking, choking, mm -hmm. come on spitting. your face, spitting. Yeah, yeah, it's gross, and it's it, and so uh, I'm not surprised that. Kids have mental problems. <laughs> Fucked up ideas of sex. Yeah. Yes, if, I mean, what what's a first date, a re first real date like? Right. When you saw, you know, a team of Japanese businessmen come on some schoolgirl's face when you were ten. <laughs> oh, you saw that one? The bus. <laughs> That's that was a rough one. I think it was a flight attendant. I don't think it was a schoolgirl. Yeah. Um, the uh, and there was a squid. Yeah. Oh, there's always squids. They're into octopuses, tentacles, yes. and shit. Yes. Yeah, it's it's not necessarily benign, but neither is alcohol, neither is gambling. Right, I'm not saying it should a lot be of other outlawed, yeah. but I mean, if I was a parent, yeah, it's I, an I issue. would keep and it away from kids. There's also an issue that you don't tell kids about it, so they don't they find out from other kids there's no discussion of what it is there's no like real you know, like no one in their right mind would ever sit down and watch porn with their son and say this is what i want you to avoid like this is why i want you to avoid this right but it's probably not the worst idea i mean look it's there there comes a, a legality issue like uh, i mean i don't even think it's legal to watch porn with a 13 year old kid but if you if you have a son and he's 13 and you know he's going to be exposed to these things you almost have a responsibility to talk him through it and just give him some to right. give him some understanding of what it, what is the landscape ha here's a big one why are these girls doing this okay here's something that people don't like to admit that enjoy porn the vast majority of them have been molested the vast majority of who has been molested? Porn art, porn actors. 
porn is stars. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was some study they did on um, girls who get into porn who have been sexually abused, mentally abused, and physically abused. And it was right. overwhelming. It was overwhelming. I mean, it, obviously, it's just anecdotal. It's based on one group of people that they. I don't know if it's, it's the, not the largest study. It's not. It's not, not hard, surprising at all. No. So they're, they're searching for acceptance, and they're, they're willing to do something that's way outside the norm. I'm sure there's just some girls that are just really promiscuous. They're into sex, and there's nothing wrong with them. They just right. love it, and they love performing. Right. But I think there's less of them than there yeah. are of the girls who were, were probably abused. And, you know, maybe they turn a negative into a positive. I'm not saying right. they shouldn't do it. I'm not casting any judgment, but I am right. saying that – you should understand what this thing is like what this why how come some people like to fuck on camera and everybody else is afraid the well, you know that you're going to see their genitals i don't know about the watching <laughs> porn with your uh, son joe but yeah i uh, wouldn't suggest it either i'm no, just saying i'm kidding but uh what i would tell a kid especially mm -hmm. a boy um is son what you're seeing in porn don't think that women really like that because they don't. They don't want to have somebody come on their face. Someone must. We were so, talking. Of course, someone likes anything. That's one of the bad things about the internet <laughs> is that you could, in the old days, if you were some sort of weirdo pervert, you thought, and it was the world was better because you thought that you were completely alone in the world. Now, whatever your kink is, you could put it on the internet. You could write, you know, I want a hooker to shit on me while I play with electric trains, and. <laughs> it's a whole category. <laughs> There'll be a on thousand people in two minutes <laughs> who are saying, "Me too." Yeah, and. That I don't know. That now you have a community yeah. of electric train shit around. You got an you echo know. chamber. Yes, they're all enjoying shitting on you with right. electric chains. So that's all unhealthy. Yeah. But but I just don't think that. I mean, that would be my main lesson to a to an adolescent boy. Okay, we can't keep the porn away from you. Just don't think that's real. The way real women are, or what real women like. I don't think they like Tinder either. In fact, I watched some documentary, I can't remember what it was called, I think it was on HBO, about dating on social media, and that was the main theme of it, was women are doing it, young women, but they don't like it, and it's not surprising they don't like it. Guys are, of course, wired very differently, and they just want to hook up and move on. I read also an article about it, and the I think it was in Vanity Fair, and the the woman says, okay, she did it once, she tried Tinder, she goes to a hotel or meets a guy she had just met over the phone, and they fuck, and then she said, as I was getting dressed, I turned around and he was sitting on the bed looking at Tinder. Whoa. You know, so he had just come, and here he is looking for the next Fix. Victim. And victim. This is this willing is, participant, I yes, would say. Yes, I'm not I mean I'm saying How victim dare you with the victim I, I, talk. No, I'm not I don't mean <laughs> I, I didn't mean I know that. You're No, you're right. She's the not, next uh, he's a predator. Right. She was a willing to right. uh, uh, predator. How dare you? That's what I'm saying. He's out there hunting. <laughs> yeah. He's trying to get gals. But, but it's just what his <laughs> gals. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get the ladies. Yeah. Um but women It's not that's designed not for what women's women sensibilities. Want. No. It's not most just women, not. no. They it's, had, remember Ashley Madison? Was yes, that the, yeah, It yeah. was the cheating site, mm -hmm. and it was like uh, 12,000 women and 126 million men. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it was like some crazy number like that, well, and most of the women on it were hookers. Were fake, <laughs> too. There's a lot of them that were fake. They had like fake accounts. <laughs> it's just, yeah. That was hilarious when you have a, when you have a, a dating site set up just for people that want to cheat, and then they all get busted because someone hacks into it. Like, do you right. fucking dummies use your real name? Like, Jesus Christ. I mean, just... Uh, you ever read that book, Sapiens? Yes. Such a great book. And he goes into the fact that monogamy, probably not what, what is wired in us. It's the reason why there's so much misery about relationships is it probably wasn't that way in early man, and I'm saying early man, like human, homo sapiens, which haven't been on earth that long. There's no primates know. that are monogamous. They've ne never found one. Right. And, and we are primates. Right. And um, we probably had a system, system is just how we were, that was closer to the chimps and where it was like communal fatherdom. 
You know, you didn't really know whose kid it was. So there wasn't this possessiveness because, you know, I guess the women fuck different men in the, in the grouping. And there wasn't that feeling of I own you. Right. And this pussy's mine and all that bullshit. You read Sex at Dawn? No. It's basically about that. Okay. So my friend, Dr. Chris Ryan, wrote it. Okay. Interesting. Uh, that's It's basically about that. It's about how people behave, the polyamorous relationships that they had in these right. primitive cultures and that before DNA testing and before they understood right. paternity. That's really what it was all about. It was about the community would raise children. Everybody would raise... And they would, there was a lot of like shared sex in between different people. So, they, much, so much of love is... I think possessiveness, what people think is love. It's not love, mm. you know? And, and also, you make me feel good is not love either. To me, and they always say, love is the thing that has never been able to be defined. I don't think it's that hard. It's, it's selflessness. It's when I care for your happiness more than my own. That's love in any kind of relationship, mm -hmm. man or woman, whatever. Or at least as much as my own. Yeah, right. Yeah. And if if you if being without me would actually make you happier, then I'm for that. That's love. That's not that would not characterize most of my early relationships. Mm -hmm. How I felt and what I thought what well, what love was. Well, it's interesting when we look at other animals, right? Because you blow monogamy me great. and That's other not animals. Love. <laughs> <laughs> In other animals, monogamy isn't a choice. Like the animals that are monogamous, the monogamous, they don't have any desire. Like it's naturally built in, wired into their system. It's not like they choose. Like swans? So there's a bunch of them. Penguins, for instance. Penguins, yeah. yeah. There's well, a few. Penguins are gay. We know that. Well, they all look the same. They might as well be gay. <laughs> they, no, aren't there gay? Wasn't there a big thing about gay penguins? Well, there was a story, I feel like, about gay penguins or. Really? Yeah, there's something because I feel like the. Usual suspects Jamie? on the right. <laughs> yeah, look up Charlie Chaplin, gay, gay penguin penguins, fucking, fucking kids. Um, <laughs> Smile. There's something. Uh, this, they, they were there. Maybe it was a story. Something that made the evangelicals mad about about penguins. Peng yeah, about Jesus penguins. Christ. I think it's penguins. Maybe it's they were in. My point would be that any of these animals that are doing this, they're not doing this because they have a, a choice. They understand what it is. Oh, New York Times, gotcha. Gay penguins and their hope for a baby have enchanted Berlin. Two male penguins at the zoo Berlin have yes, adopted an egg. That's it. That's what it is. Two male penguins adopted an egg. And People are upset. Delighting Germans, but upsetting Pat Robertson big time. Oh, was he bummed out about that? <laughs> yes, yeah, somebody like that was, or all of them were. I'm sure the family council, those types, you think they want to have the example of penguins being gay? Uh, I wonder you know, if, if that they even to. give a fuck or if it's just a hustle at this point. Do you think they really give a fuck about these penguins being gay? I think they have to say something because it's some new thing to talk about and it gives them fuel yes. for outrage. Yeah. It's a juicy story in the news they could jump on. Yeah, I mean, Pat Robertson, is it? Uh, he's still on TV, right? He's a, he's, yeah. He's a, he needs material like you and I do. Yes, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. 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 You never know with these people. Gay penguins. That's where it, that's where you draw the line. It's where that's I do. it. <laughs> that's enough. <laughs> Their, their, their agenda has moved over to the penguins. Whew. Such a strange time. So it's a strange time where like we're I, I feel like if you read Steve, Steven Pinker stuff, he talks about how yes. this life has never really been easier than we have it today. Right. But it's also probably one of the reasons why people are so outraged about things today. It's just there's it's so there's less real shit that's dangerous in this world there's less there still is real danger there still is real murder and real rape and real robberies but there's less of it than ever before but yet there's more outrage than ever before about nonsense things well when societies get too successful and you could make that claim about america that's when they become a feat and that's when they become soft yes and that's when they fall this is a story that goes back to ancient rome and Lots yeah. of other societies. Yeah. You, you're you're a victim of your success. Mm -hmm. In a, in a large way, we're we're that because yes, people don't. We we're just talking about how people were rougher. Yeah. No Novocaine. You know that wasn't even the roughest thing. We don't know hardship except for that sliver of the country that fights the wars. Mm -hmm. Those people know hardship. Yeah. Of course, we do have poverty in America, but there's also a fairly substantial safety net 
that this country has. I mean, no. In comparison to other parts of the world, but you know, there's parts of the world that are riddled yes. with crime and, and gangs. Yeah. And oh, of those 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 Abs. people deal with real hardship. Oh, real hardship. Those yeah. are the people coming yeah. from central those Central mm-hmm. American countries that they always are freaking out about the mm-hmm. Trump administration because yes, when gangs ruled the country in El Salvador and Honduras, those places, life is precarious and easy to lose. Yeah. But I know Steven Pinker's point, you know, which is a great point, is like let's not forget that in the last 20, 30 years, the amount of people we've risen out of extreme poverty, the people who used to live on a dollar a day, um, it wasn't that long ago when I read this that a billion people defecate in the street. You know, that's where they poop. That's all improved greatly. Now, part of the reason why Trump people (laughs) are upset about jobs and stuff and going overseas, well, that's part of the reason why, is because we lifted out of extreme poverty people all over the world. But they took those manufacturing jobs. That's why they're not living in extreme poverty Mm. and why they're not pooping in the street, because they're making Trump ties as opposed to somebody in Ohio. So... Pick your poison. Yeah. I mean, this is like what we're talking about with us growing up, that life was rougher and life is easier today, but you have more access to information. So maybe it could be better. And then things seem to be moving in a better direction in terms of things being safer, less violence, less crime, less rape. And then people also get upset at you bringing up those statistics. That's where it's really interesting. Pinker gets attacked for just stating statistical facts. Just say, and he's not making value judgments. He's just saying, hey, things are, if you look at the overall numbers of things, this is the safest time to be alive ever. It's, and the people, no, but what about this? What about that? Like, it's a horrible yeah. hallmark of our era that we live in that facts almost always come second. Yes. Your political agenda comes first. Yeah. And if it doesn't fit in, then we don't want to hear those facts. And that's the left and the right. Yeah, it is the left and the right. It's both. And it's... Um, it's it should be it it should be something that everybody rejects it should be something that angers everyone it shouldn't be tied to one party or another party and it really should be something that if there's a if there's a real problem with communication in this society one of them is the denial of actual facts and information. If we, we, if we know things, we have rock-solid statistics, right. whether it's about climate change, whether I, it's about war, the budget, whatever the fuck it is. If you have a real number yes. and you want to spin and deny, and like that, that's a giant problem. It's a giant problem. Right. I get madder at the left because I want them to be better, and they right. should be better. And right. they're, the, they're the science party, yeah. and they're supposedly the fact people. I expect this shit from the right, right, denying climate change and so forth. They've been doing that for a long time. The left has this dirty thing. If you disagree with them in any way, you become a, an alt-right person. Like, right. I mean, it's obviously a small sliver or of people that are doing this. Yeah. Boy, I got stuck in this alt-right category. I'm like, you guys are out of your fucking mind. Right. I've never exactly. voted right in my life. Right. I, I know. But there's a... There's a, a I feel like, I'm sure as you do sometimes, uh, a man without a country. Yes. Yes. And there's a group of us, Sam Harris. Yes. People you've had on. Yeah. uh, Jordan Peterson, Mm -hmm. uh, Barry Weiss. Yeah. You know, I just, we're all progressives. Yeah. But sensible progressives. Real progressives. Real progressives. We're we're not blindly ideological to our party. Yeah. Right. And we don't chase these virtue signalers who are always... As a friend of mine said, they wake up offended. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I'm always reading a story. Like daily, I read something. And what goes through my mind is this country now is completely binary. There's only two camps. We're totally tribal. You're mm-hmm. either red or blue, liberal or conservative. And everything that one side does, that anybody does, that represents that side has to be owned by that entire side because people will go, well, you're the party of. So whenever there's something on the left that's cuckoo crazy, we all own it. Yeah. And that's one reason why Trump won. Sure. Because people, you go through the polling, his fans are not oblivious to his myriad flaws. 
what they love about him, what they all say they love, is he wasn't politically correct. It's, it's hard to measure how much people have been choking on that political correctness. They do not want to walk on eggshells. Yeah. They do, want, do not want to think that one little misstep and they'll get fired or they'll be castigated. And these are not just famous people. I mean, th- these are just regular people. And I think when someone reads the kind of stories you see every day and it's an eye roll and it's a eye roll at the left, that's when you lose people. I'll give you an example. I was about two weeks ago, the Giants, my football team, the New York football Giants, cut, well, I think his name is Janoris Jenkins. Is he using the R word? Yes. Did we have to say the R word? <laughs> no, you can say retarded. Okay. Well, we're, we're just, we're not saying <laughs> it. You got to look like, oh my God. I don't know what the fucking rules are. Y- yes. Uh, and he... Yeah. he Okay, first of all, I don't understand why that generation feels the need to engage with their fans on Twitter, but he was. And some Somebody guy was, needs to teach him social media. Yeah, some that, guy was criticizing yeah. him, and he's a good right. cornerback or yeah. safety, uh, whatever he is, and the, uh, was criticizing him, and he answered back. Yeah. Again, I don't know why, but saying, here are my stats. I'm pretty good. I only can do my job. Right. Dot, the, dot, retard. Okay, Meanwhile, wait, be better missed, if he had missed three point. dots. Missed be nice part of the story dots. I'm going to explain. So then the guy, the fan says, well, why does it matter? The team is losing. And that's when Janoris Jenkins said, I can only do my job, retard, and cut. like Cut from the team. Yeah. Cut. Yeah. Like the next day. And... First of all, I think he said it's something like, I thought it was a hood thing. You know, maybe Janoris Jenkins didn't get the memo because he's not, you know, like on Twitter 24-7 and living with the wokesters that we don't do this anymore. I think they offered him a chance to apologize and he said I think he did. Did he? I think he did. He did after they cut him. But, yeah, I don't think he like stood, I insist on saying this where I would, that would, but you know, there, there seems like there's no room anymore for someone just to go, oh, sorry, I didn't realize this was such a thing because, you know, they do move the goalposts right. often and they yeah. like to because it's easier to catch people that way. So yes. how about just, oh, sorry, I guess, you know, we don't do this anymore, my bad, and move on with our lives well, instead of, no, you're canceled, you're cut, you are irredeemable. Yeah. It's hard. It's, ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And what I'm saying is like every day there's some story like that. And yeah. it just all goes into the bin left wing. Yeah. And that's when people go, you know what? Trump's an asshole. I don't like him, but I don't want to live in that world. These people are even fucking crazier. Yeah. And that is the great danger of reelecting him. And they very well may do it. Yeah, it very well may. Yeah, th- this overcorrection, overreaction, and things like that infuriates people. And they, they love it when Trump says crazy shit because it sounds like something yeah. that they would say. He's trolling. Like he had that one speech where he's talking about China. This is the way you talk to China. They say, listen, motherfuckers. Yes. And everybody went, yes. 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 Yeah. Right. Like just that alone. Yeah. Like I even laughed and clapped. I was like, that's fucking hilarious. Because yeah. that is what you would hope some crazy well, version of a president would say that would never really exist, well, but all of a sudden he exists. He sometimes he says something that I totally do not want a president to say. But, but. <laughs> if he wasn't president, like for example, when he was confronted, may have been by Bill O'Reilly when he was still extant, uh, about Putin killing journalists or something, and Trump said something like, uh, well, we're not so innocent either. Yeah. Now, I don't think the president of the United States should say that, but you know who else says that? Noam Chomsky. Yeah. That's like something Noam Chomsky says. America's guilty of also doing yes. these horrible things. We're not innocent either. Yeah, he would be a little bit more articulate about it, but yeah. Right. Yeah. But the point is that no one judges anymore by the content of what they say. It's just by whose team are you on. Yes. So if you liked it when Norm, Noam Chomsky said it, you shouldn't hate it that much when Trump said it or vice versa. If you hated it that Noam Chomsky said it, then you should hate it that Trump said it. But that's not how people react. Well, the team thing is so prevalent that even when he does something militarily, like backs out of a country, you see people on the left criticizing him for not 
not going in or not not engaging right. like Jesus Christ you guys are supposed to be the people that always don't want war and when someone well, who's the president does something uh, that's n- n- not a move towards war we should all be saying yes please more of this he's got a good thing here's a good thing it's not like we, but we want to categorize people as being, like you said, one or zero, binary, irredeemable, binary. like either chosen or irredeemable. And My you have team. to be very careful with how you talk or you get labeled in, in one or two of those categories. And people are so scared now. Communicate. It's, I, I had a conversation with a friend a while back, and he, we were, it was a crazy conversation. It was alcohol involved. <laughs> but he said something really ridiculous. He was saying that maybe it's good that uh, women get so much money in divorce because of all the shit they've been through from men over the years. And I was like, "What do you?" I'm like, "What? That, what does that have to do with money and divorce? Like, if that's an individual person that's getting money from another individual person, is she getting? Is she collecting? Is this like reparations for all the horrible things that have happened for women?" <laughs> and he goes, "Well," and so he starts getting defensive. And he goes, "Well, what about uh, income inequality that women have to deal with?" I go, "Oh, Jesus!" Mm-hmm. I go, "Well, you know that's not real, right?" And he goes, what do you mean? I go, it's not like they have the same jobs. It's not like both women, the man and a woman are both male men. They both do the same amount of houses, but the man makes a dollar when the woman makes 70 cents. He goes, that's exactly what it is. I go, the fuck it is. That's Ill- not what it is. It's illegal. It, it is illegal. We've and already I, passed that I had law. To explain, but right. Everybody walked on eggshells. Everybody was right. like, oh, Jesus, what are you saying? Right. Like you're saying income inequality is not real? Right. Like, no, it's exactly. not, not. Not that it's not real. There's so many of those mic drop Yes. phrases that yes. they use, you know, kids in cages, yes. which of course we don't want kids in cages, but right. there's a whole discussion to be had about immigration yes. as opposed to just kids in cages or Islamophobia. Of course, that is a real thing. It exists, but there's a whole other discussion, but just these, look, the left often uninformed. Yeah. They just are. But I mean, they have these bullet points that they feel like they definitely can shut a conversation down. That's with. what I mean. They, they don't in, feel like they inequality. have to learn a yeah. lot about a subject yeah. because you have these mic drop sayings or phrases that just stop people from talking. Well, I'd fortunately known the actual statistics. And so when we were talking about it, I was saying, no, no, yes. they choose different jobs. And also they negotiate for themselves yes. differently. Yes. They need to negotiate for themselves better. Well, that's one of the things when, when people accuse Jordan Peterson of being sexist. You know, Jordan Peterson literally counseled and coached women how to be more assertive right. in their jobs to get better raises. Sure. He was really explaining how to do this and, and, and just even maybe possibly against your better instincts to exert yourself and show that you understand your value. And this is what men do. And this is why men get raises. And oftentimes women just kind of keep it to themselves and they're a little nervous about it. But it is amazing. I mean, you mentioned divorce. Yeah, they don't assert as well uh, going for a raise, but boy, the divorce thing. I mean, and that can go both ways if the woman is the one who has more money. Yeah, but but when the fuck does that ever happen? That's like women who beat up men. like you know yeah. like women right. women beat men up too like when i hear that i'm like oh I my always god say, then go to the gym yes you should well, go to the gym man it's like these and fucking get yourself a little stronger. men's rights assholes are like there's so much to make fun of men's rights guys but i had one of them on my one of my comedy specials i had a bit about it where they were saying do you know that men get raped more often than women i go yeah by other men, you fucking idiot. Right, exactly. Like, <laughs> what do you, what do you yeah, think? I remember that, yeah. The chicks are out there raping dudes? What do you right. think? Cheerleaders well, are out there raping also, cops? Uh, have you had Christina Hoff Summers? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I love her. Yeah, yeah I love her yeah. too. She was on our show recently. And, you know, we were talking about the fact that also they don't bring up a lot of the time that most of the horrible, dirty jobs in the world yes. are done by men. Yeah. They're the ones who are up on the telephone pole. Most likely you know. to die on the job, most likely to be right. murdered, most likely to go to jail. Yeah. Most likely to get a much longer jail sentence yeah. for the same crime. So we're not crying about being men. We're just saying, as she says, life is a complex yes. mixture of advantages and disadvantages. Yeah. I think the pendulum's swinging the other way, though. I think really dumb statements like "fuck all white men," like we used to hear on Twitter, and people used to like a- applaud and retweet it. I think people are now like, "Oh, come on, the fuck." Well, that's like, a little out there, but I have heard when now it's going in the other direction because the race is winnowing. But at the point of say six months a year ago, when lots of people were getting into the race, at some point there were twenty-four Democrats in there, and when a white guy would get in. 
it was very common to hear, do we need another white guy? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that was completely okay yeah. on the left. And it's like, okay, but then we are saying that we're using race yes. to judge whether someone is qualified. Qual right. Yeah. Exactly. We are using race and gender to say whether someone is qualified, just so we understand what we're right. doing here. Because I don't think that's exactly what Martin Luther King meant no. when he said, judge by the content of their character and not the color of their skin, which seems to elude a well, certain What's the segment. dumbest form of identity politics? And it's really ridiculously dumb when they don't realize that that same sort of strategy is going to come right back around at you. It's like people that think, they, oh, that guy's pissing me off. I'm going to go fucking punch him. Well, guess what? He's going to punch you back like this is this is not it's but, not that simple when you when you if you go around judging people based on their gender and their their yeah. color and their race guess what they're going to do that to you now like but, this is it's it's I, a I terrible wanna, strategy i want to i i want to know how the divorce laws came to be i do i want to know I, I somebody must have written a book on it i just want to know how we got to this place where um you know, first of all, this idea that you have to live in the style of which you've become accustomed. I can help you here. I can okay. help you a co couple, couple ways. Here's the big one. Lawyers make a lot of money if there's a large settlement. So it's lawyers. Yes. Lawyers don't make a lot of money if there's no settlement. You know, Phil Hartman, when he was getting divorced, one of the things that he said to me, I go, dude, just fucking give her half. Come on, man. You make a lot of money. He goes, it's not half. He was crazed. He's like, it's two thirds. He goes, the fucking lawyers get a third. It's a goddamn exactly. scam. And I've had friends that have gotten divorced. And even though they were, they had come to an agreement with the, the ex, like, let's listen with this, this, and you'll get this and I'll get this. Fine. Then the lawyers jump in. He's trying to fuck you. And this and that, they're trying to fuck you over. That's, you deserve more. That's exactly and, the plot of and, the movie Marriage. Have you seen Marriage no, Story? No, I haven't. Oh, no. it's terrific. I was, again, it at the beginning because it was about an actress and a theater director. And I was like, Jesus fucking Christ, can't you th at least pretend that there are people in America not outside of your exact circle? There have been so many big movies, you know, that are just about your right. world of show business. Have a little creativity. Make them something else. But okay, I got over that. And then it's just a terrific movie about... There's no bells and whistles. It's just, we're married, we seem very happy, and then, well, we're not happy, and we're going to get divorced, and then um, we're going to, let's just do it amicably and not get lawyers involved, and then it all falls apart. And once it goes down that path that you're talking about, it just becomes as vicious as anything yeah. without guns. Well, I had a friend who got divorced, and no, f no family, okay, no children. They didn't have children. And uh, it dragged on for more than, I think, almost three years. And even though they had come yeah. to some kind of, sort of conclusion, he was paying for his wife's lawyer. I go, it's that's, like you're paying for the general of the army that's trying to kill you. You're paying for someone to fuck you in the ass. Yeah. You're getting fucked in the ass. It broke him. It, you you can feel it. I have see, seen it so many body. men <gasps> broken by Devastated. it. Devastated. Every time somebody says, uh, you know, they... People, unfortunately, get a horrible disease like cancer, and they say, I couldn't have gotten through it without my wife. I always think, yeah, and maybe she gave it to you. <laughs> I don't mean, of course, literally, but I just mean that when you're the in a stress. bad relationship, yeah. the stress, yeah. uh, we don't know what contributes all the things to cancer, but uh, that certainly is, I'm sure, one of them. And then going through a divorce like that, I've seen people, like, a, like you say, just broken. They get wrecked. And it's a system. The reason why the divorce laws are set up the way they're set up, people think, oh, we're protecting women. Horseshit. They're doing it so that they can extract the maximum amount of money out of the male. That way, the lawyer gets the biggest chunk that they could possibly get. Most lawyers have a, they're working on a percentage basis. Right. Especially if a woman doesn't have as much money oh. or if she's, you know, the, the lawyer will come to her, look, we've got a deal here. We'll, we'll figure this out. Uh, don't pay me now. We're going to make sure we get, right. get you the most. We'll, we'll take care of it all in the end. And this is what has happened to several of my friends that have been divorced. And you know what it is once you see it. What I get and I understand and I accept and I uh, I support is child support. I mean, I've I grew up with a deadbeat dad. My dad never paid for shit, 
And I have many friends that have also experienced a lot of financial hardship growing up because their dad was a piece of shit and, and didn't want to pay for their children. But pe people very close to me, including my wife. But when there's a big difference between that, a man taking responsibility for his children, there's a big difference between that and alimony. Alimony is creepy. There's something creepy about, like, my friend, like I said, didn't even have uh, a child with this woman. He is still paying her, by the way. This is the same guy, very good friend of mine, has been divorced for 14 years, has been married for 12 to a new woman, still paying the old woman. And my joke was like, you fucked her so hard, she can't work. Right. Like, she literally can't work. Because he, he's a wealthy man. He made good money. And he works really hard. He's a he's he's not in the business. He's a, he, he you know he, he has a real job and he works you know long fucking hours every oh, day, I, and he has his own business and he has to pay hundreds I, of thousands of dollars to someone he doesn't even talk to anymore guys go because to he jail. used to fuck her. Guys go yeah. to jail. I, I I knew of a guy who was a doctor who <laughs> went to jail every night because he couldn't make the payments. Oh god. And they would like let him out on weekends to do rounds and stuff, but he was it's I got uh, a better one for you. Want to get in crazy? Yeah. Hit um, me. Dave Foley, who's on news radio yeah, with sure. me, Dave when Foley. he was uh, getting divorced was when he was on news radio. So it was at a, ver a financial peak. You know, he was the star of the show. He's making a lot of money. Right. And so his, oh, yeah. his payments get to that. were yeah. set up for that. Sure. So this is in Canada, right? Right. Oh. And he, the judge tells him, he, he tells the judge, I don't make that kind of money anymore. That was an extraordinary right. time in my life. It's very hard to make that kind of money. You know, I'm an actor. I just... The doctor, the judge rather says, your ability to pay has no relation to your obligation to pay. Wow. Think of that. Just pause here for a moment. What a statement. You're, and where else would we say that? It's insane. And we're it, talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. Hundreds of thousands. Like as if he's supposed to conjure this up. Like his career is supposed to magically resurrect itself in some really and it financial is, and viable way. And since it way. is usually the man still who probably has the more money and is paying the woman, Yes, it's very anachronistic to how we have come to think about women as equal and strong and able to do everything we can do. But when it comes to this, it's like, oh, we got to take care of them. Well, I don't, <laughs> they're suddenly I, they're, they're, again, it's like, they're very dependent. I think it's a scam that's set up because the men in general are in control of the finances yeah. or make more money and they can extract more money from them that way. I don't see a lot of people way. turning it down. Yeah, I mean, that's that's why the system, I think, is set up the way it's set up. It's, it's dark, man. I mean, the only time... It's happened the other way that I know of is Tom Arnold. Tom yes. Arnold oh, got does, away clean. Sure, yes, it does. It does happen <laughs> he, he's the other won, way. He's yeah. one for the males. Right. We got one on the board. There's like, if the board was like here, if it, was, it would be a fucking billion scratches on one side and four lines and the one through it. See, that, and then next to it, there's like Tom Arnold. That's why I, I never- like a couple of the dudes. Never understood the concept of marriage because- when people would say, why don't you want to get married? I'd say, why would I invite the federal and state government into my love life? It's very important. What you, ha is. you have to have it. You, otherwise, it's not real. If you don't get a, a signed piece of paper, wow. what the fuck do you have? Just your feelings for that other person? Not good enough. How wow. should I tell her friends? She's got to tell her friends that he well, really you've, cares. You've been brainwashed by... No, he really cares. <laughs> You think I'm serious? I can see she's trained you to you say the right answer. Well, I, I think that's, that's a crazy. That's I, I think that's a crazy backward way to look at it. That without the piece of paper, it's not real. It's not real. Whatever you have with this someone emotionally, uh, that's what's real. The paper is what's fake. The you shouldn't be worried about divorce because we're never getting divorced. Oh, so I'm not I don't worried know what about the you. Fuck, you're doing. Like why? Why you're getting so upset about this, Bill? Just sign the paper oh. and get married. We're gonna be together forever. I don't know what you're worried about. Jesus Christ, you're, you're freaking out about. Don't you love me? You're freaking out about a divorce. We're not getting divorced. We love each other. God, sign it. Sign it. And then when you sign it, the darkness, clouds roll over. Ha 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 ha. 
but also like humans change. It's like we. It's so, it's so funny when you you could say about anything else. Oh, I'm not married to it. You know, do you want that thing there? Oh, I'm not married to it. But with a human, the thing that's most malleable, <laughs> we're like, uh, yep, I'm going to marry it. Well, they, but did, you know, it, but for some people, it works fantastically. I think in some countries I they total- actually have term limits. They actually have uh, marriage terms. I like, don't think that's a real thing. But I think I, it I, is. Really? Go, go, yeah, Google it. Some countries have like a term. We did this before, right? Yeah, it's real. Some countries have like you could get married for like and seven years. Oh, I see. And then you, you have, have to like a seven year. Yeah. And you can decide at the end of it. You're like, look, I think we're good. Let's get out of here. Right. Yeah. Well, but that's putting a level of logic into it that's probably not going to really obtain when the moment comes because well, by that important. time you're so codependent girls are not going to tolerate that they're going let me right. let me ask you this how long right. you been with bill <laughs> You've been with, and he wants a fucking term limit. Right. My God, you guys are going to be together forever. <laughs> what are you doing with the fucking term limit? Because I can tell you, if you stuck with Dave, I bet Dave wouldn't ask for it. Right. Me. Dave's not like that. Like, Dave might be just a little boring. Maybe he's not as funny, but he's a fucking solid guy and he would have signed the contract. You'd be fine, girl. You'd it's be like, fine. It's like when agents are yeah. competing Oof. to sign you and they're like, you didn't read for that? Oh, I could have well, gotten you. As soon as there's that. a financial incentive with anything, things get squirrely. That's you know? what I'm saying. Yeah, but it also, you know, I remember you. It's funny you mentioned Tom Arnold. I had him on the very first episode of Politically Incorrect. I think with Roseanne, and they were talking about marriage. And he said the great thing about marriage is uh, when you have a big fight and somebody says I'm leaving, you can go. You can't. We're married. And I got what he was saying. Some people like that. That you have this. Yeah. This self-imposed barrier that makes um, it more difficult it, it's like a waiting period with guns <laughs> you know or when they make you look at the sonogram when you want an abortion in some states look at your fucking baby right. on the computer screen there and tell him come back tomorrow and tell me you want to kill that kid you right. know you have a waiting period you have to cool off you can't just leave whereas right. if you're not married you can right unless you live together that's more complicated or kids are more complicated but yeah and uh the other one we got on the board is Kevin Federline. We got him too. What do you mean on the? Oh, oh, right, right. Britney's. <laughs> he's Britney's <laughs> oh, baby daddy. Yeah. yeah. He's uh, he's getting yes, paid. Yes, that's driving right. A Ferrari he, right he now. Absolutely, Britney's cash. Absolutely, absolutely. He did very yeah. well. Yeah. Plus, he got to fuck Britney Spears, which is a, a double fist pump. Is that a good thing? Oh I, yeah. Oh, you know how look, great she first, must be. He bed? hasn't said one thing <laughs> the whole time. We've been here for sixteen hours. She's he has not said one fuck. word, and. That was the one thing that made a sound come out of Jamie. She's got it's two things that men, men enjoy. She's hot and she's crazy. She's still? probably fantastic in bed. Is Brittany? But still hot? Yeah. There was a photo of her recently on Instagram. She still looks hot as fuck. I thought Yeah, she, she was in a bikini. I thought, think she fell apart? Okay. She might be. I've never seen her in real life. You don't know until you see him, right? Uh, right. I mean, I I didn't. Yeah, I, I guess I haven't followed. That's follow. her right now. I haven't. That's her right now? Yep. Well, that's a lot right of... Right now. That's a no l- makeup, no that, filter. No, I was going to say, that's a lot of... <laughs> Look at that picture right there. That's a lot oh, of... Oh, that one looks crazy as well, fuck. Well, that... She got some see, crazy that videos I do recently. not find... Oh, she's crazy oh. as fuck, man. But that, that one right there that we're saying is so great... Upper I, left? No, no, the right oh, the in the middle. the one in the middle? I do not... Oh, listen, if it's I, 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 2 o'clock in the morning and you're both drunk, that's what you want. Well, I'm never drunk anymore, <laughs> and now I go to bed at midnight, which is a quite <laughs> She's a... She's knocking at your door. Bill, wake up! It's Brittany! <laughs> and, I'm here to fuck! And my dad's here with me because oh. he has to be wherever I go. Right, I see that controversy. Yes, that... Well, she's like 36 years old now, too. Do you think she still has to do that? Well, she does. Yeah. There's a whole free Britney movement from people who have <laughs> nothing better to do with their time, and there's no more <laughs> issues... <laughs> Of all the issues in the country that you could <laughs> adopt as something to take to care about, but people are saying because yes, she still is under that um, order that her father has to run her life. Because remember when she went? Nuts? Yeah, she went crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think she's oh, yeah. probably always crazy. She just expressed it in a way that made people concerned. And also, I think she's a, a sweet Southern girl who show business will make you crazy. For when, sure. I mean, they ch- the paparazzi chased her like they chased Lady Diana. She couldn't yeah. leave her house. Yeah. Um, and Yeah, that level of fame yes, is almost unmanageable it, for anybody. It is. It what is. we saw Elvis go through or Michael Jackson go through or any, any like... Right. They, they get, you get to that super pop star level, like yep. no one can handle it. No one. And it's... it. Yes, there is a point where it's 
uh, fame, I think we know, is terrific, mostly unless it gets to that point, right? Yeah. I mean, when it's the people trying to help you, when your other people are just looking out like, you know, salespeople and people at airline counters and people who just look at you like, what the fuck do you want? Oh, I don't know, just for you to do your job. But if they recognize you, then suddenly you get a smile. I always say being famous is like living in a small southern town, you know, in the <laughs> 50s. Right? Hello, how you doing? <laughs> yeah, it's so good to see you. You know, they're just yeah. people are just friendly in a way that they aren't anymore in big cities. Well, you know where they're still friendly like that? Dallas, Texas. Oh da yes, the Dallas, South is Texas is <clears throat> crazy. South it's like, is all the South is yeah. is still a friendlier place. I love playing the South. Yeah, I'm always in the South. I never considered Texas <clears throat> the South. It's kind of oh, its yeah. own thing. It's sort of the yes, South. It is but it's the yes. West. You're as right. much as it is the South. It's everything. It's a world. Because we're the South. What? We're the South. If you look at the South of the country, well, we're the West. Southern California. We're the West, but we're, we're also the, the South. Texas yeah. is a weird well, thing. But we know what we mean when we talk yes. about the South. We're the talking old, about the old, Southeast. Old Dixie. Yes. And, um, but Texas is so big. Austin, to me, is not Texan enough. It might as well be in New York. You know? It's more like San Francisco, like a slice yes, of San it's, Francisco it's, it's thrust too liberal. into the middle of the yeah. <laughs> Yes, I do. I, I want the... Uh, you want real barbecue? Yes, I like... Well, not barbecue, but I like that, that Texas flavor. Houston, I love. I, I always love had Houston. a better... When, back when I used to go out after a show, always had a better time in the South than the North. Much rather party in Houston than, I don't know, Boston, which is a beautiful city, and I love it, and I love performing there. But I never found the party... But you can't miss it in Houston. Yeah. You know. They're a little more, more jovial. Yeah. Jovial. <laughs> it's interesting how we think of the South, too. Like, Arizona's not the South, but it's fucking for sure the South. I mean, it's oh, bordering Mexico. Yes. Well, yeah. Arizona, yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're bringing up the rear a little That's bit. That's a strange on, spot. On, uh, certain civilization-wise. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're... There's some very conservative... I mean, it's the conservative bastion. I mean, this yeah. is Barry Goldwater country uh -huh. and... Yeah, Arizona's you know, a weird, Sheriff Joe weird Arpaio. That guy, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, there's some real, real cavemen in, yeah. in Arizona. But I love well, it's Arizona. it's an open too. carry state. Yeah, but look, when you stick to cities, which we do, you know, we're not playing theaters in the sticks. It doesn't matter what state you're in. You're always going to be and get a liberal audience. Look at the election map every year. There's a lot of red, but any place there's a city, it's a blue dot especially if they have a college town. Mm -hmm. I played Birmingham, Alabama. It looks like any place else, at least the crowd coming to my show. I once was, I think it was Birmingham. <laughs> it was somewhere in Alabama. must have been either Birmingham or Mobile. And um, there was a <laughs> bass fishing contest or <laughs> a tournament. A, award show, tournament, something going on. Like at the same time, as my show, or maybe my show was starting and it was letting out, but there was this, I was driving up to the theater, there was a long crowd of people coming to my show who looked like, dressed like anywhere else, normal, and then on the other side of the street, going the other way, a bunch of people in flannel shirts and trucker hats, and it couldn't have been a more obvious example of two Americas. Yeah. Know? But within the city of Birmingham, Alabama, but it's still a city, and you know we see that electorally the divide. Trump does super well among people who never left the town they were born in, rural people, people out in the sticks, um, and does terrible in the cities, and now much more increasingly in the suburbs. The suburbs are the swing vote. The suburbs, last time in 2016, there was a lot of people in the suburbs who don't follow politics that closely, and they just said, boy, things suck in America. Let's let the dog drive for a while. Let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what Let's let the dog drive. <laughs> Let's see what happens. And they didn't, you know, they want to, he's a businessman. He must know how to run the economy and all this stuff. We'll try something new. Those people, I think, First of all, a lot of them have peeled away already. Those are the gettable voters. Those are the people, if the Democrats want to win, I think that they have to target. And they already have. But that's why it's so risky to run someone far left. I think if you run Amy Klobuchar, 
as much as people say, oh, she's, you know, dull and she's this and she's that and no one's excited. Yeah, but again, binary. At the end of the day, when there's only two choices, Trump or her, I think it would be very hard for her to get the nomination. I think as far as like winning the election, I think she would do it fairly easily. Do you think that Bernie's too left? Do you think he's for too a left lot of for the a lot country, of people? yes. Do you think that's real? But the media or... asks the wrong question. Yeah. The media asks, and the, those are debate tonight, the media asks the wrong question, which is, what would you do? This is a question that only makes sense if you're running for king. The question should not be, what would you do? The question is, what can you get through? What can you propose that Mitch McConnell will not either block or you can override with votes? Because that's a very different discussion. Mm. What Bernie Sanders wants to do, we shouldn't even be talking about because it's not going to happen. The free education, yes, paying the, back student loan debt. Medicare for Medicare all. Medicare for all. You know, all these – as long as the unless the Republicans self deport, even if the Democrat wins the election, there's still going to be half the country that's de- Republican and half the Congress is going to be Republican. And this just and a lot of Democrats are not for this stuff. You know, when the Democrats took over the House in 2018, it was moderate Democrats who won their elections. It wasn't the the far left. So, so you get four years of spinning your wheel in the mud. You get well, hoping to get some traction. Even yeah, if he gets in. Again, it's what can get through Congress. What can you get a consensus on? What what can you make possible? Obama, when he did health care, said yes. If we were starting from scratch, it would make sense to go for a single payer system. But we're not starting from scratch. We're starting from a system where most people already have health insurance through their employer. It's a crazy story how that happened. It was World War II, and they couldn't raise wages because that was the law, so they had to find a way to give employers something else, so they gave them health insurance. But that's what we have now. And a lot of people like it or say they like it. I don't think a lot of people like arguing with their insurance company, but they're afraid of something worse. And I don't blame them. You know, if you're going to tell me the government, and I'm a Democrat, but if you're going to tell me the government is going to smoothly handle taking over something that large, I am going to be a little skeptical. Well, you should be. They don't smoothly handle anything. There's no right. evidence they smoothly handle anything right. other than maybe delivering the news well, or delivering uh, the mail. Look, again, as an old school progressive, when you go down the list of things that the progressives have accomplished, especially in my lifetime, I, I cheer them all. Social Security, well, that was in my lifetime, but they improved it in my lifetime. Medicare, Medicaid, these are great programs. I mean, before Social Security, the senior poverty rate was like in the 28% or something, and then it went down below 10. It was a success. But when you look at what the government really, what their big successes have amounted to, it's passing out money that very often they don't have. That's what they're really good at. Running a giant healthcare system, especially when the politicians who are proposing these systems will not, A, talk enough about, we've got to cap the gouging. You can't pass out all this money. With, if you're if you're going to allow people, hospitals, pharmaceutical companies to charge char- anything they want, when the price of an EpiPen can go up from twelve dollars to twelve hundred overnight, that just can't happen. And also, they don't ask the people to lift a finger to take care of their own health. Nobody's healthcare system is going to work unless you. Involve people have some skin in the game. You can't like not tell the people, look, you can't keep eating as much as you want and as shitty a food as you want and expect us to cover the bill. You just can't. That is not something that anybody wants to hear, though. Oh, I know, because I did that editorial. And, <coughs> and then, I know. I remember that. People got upset at you. Well, people, here's the story. People did not. People loved it until James Corden said something. Oh, that's right. He had that whole... First of all, he did that, and in doing that, made fat jokes. Which was yeah, which I, was I like, did not, by the Jesus way. Jesus Christ, yeah. Mine, well, mine we were was, talking there was about nothing obesity cheap on morbid it. Morbid people. Look, morbidly obese people. Ever, first of all, he missed a great opportunity to literally save lives. If he had taken the opposite approach, he took the, the easy way out. Of course, you can always get applause for saying, oh, let's let's boo the mean man who's told yeah. the truth. That's not brave. 
Um, first of all, my point was, A, that you can't solve health care unless you ask the people to participate in that. That was one. And also that we've gone to this place where we're proud of it. We're proud of being unhealthy. Weight Watchers had to take the name Weight and Watchers out of their title. It's WW now. It, it's like, we, what? It's, see, <laughs> being fat isn't bad. What's bad is someone pointing out that fat is bad. But, I mean, I read the statistic in that editorial. 40,000 people a month, a month die from obesity. That's a crazy number. That is a crazy number. We have to somehow reverse this idea that we have in this country, not just about obesity, but about a lot of things where I'm perfect the way I am. Mm. I am just perfect the way I am. And if you say different, you're a very bad person. That's not a good place to be. It's not healthy for anybody. It's, you're, you're protecting people's emotions, but shielding them from a possible right. moment that might make them realize that they are eating themselves to death. And right. I mean, look, I said it also in the piece, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. That's fine. Whatever you think is beautiful, that's your deal. But health is science. Yeah. That's science. And when we get apoplectic when there's 50 deaths from shootings or something a month, yeah, it's very bad and we should be serious about that problem. But 50 versus 40,000 every month? And that's just what they're counting from the big ones, cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. There's literally nothing about your health that is improved by being overweight. So, you know, I said we, we shouldn't taunt people. But, you know, compare it to anything else. I also owned up to the fact that I used to drink too much and I smoked. But I didn't defend it. When someone said, you know, you went kind of hard last night with the drinking, I didn't say, how dare you drunk shame me. Well, the weird thing I about said, you're Corden, right, I did. The weird thing about Corden, too, is he's not that fat. Like, he could fix that in a couple of months. That's not that hard. No, he like took it up. It was, a, it was opportunistic. Yes, and I felt I'm, like I'm that, too. Yeah. He could have, he literally lost an opportunity to save lives. Because as someone who does struggle with weight, he could have taken the opposite approach and said, you know, he Bill makes a really good point, and um, we should we should look at how we are dealing with this. I, I noticed Jillian Michaels, the fitness expert, she took a lot of shit for Lizzo. For Lizzo, yeah. And you know, if if you want to be whatever weight you want to be, that's fine. But it's wrong to shame a fitness expert for saying this isn't healthy. Well, it gets even. She crazier. said it's not going to be that amazing when she gets diabetes. Yeah, and people went not diabetes has nothing to do with weight. Uh, Diabetes has for sure. everything to for, do with fucking, it. For sure it does. Also, they, they, they lie. They say things like, well, it's the fat gene. It's, the, you know, there's not a, <laughs> it's not that. Or here's another one. And look, this is valid. It's valid that in this country, it is a lot harder to eat right if you're poor. Yes. And we should totally address that. Yes. I doubt if it's on any candidate's top 10 list. But the way the food situation and subsidies are done in this country is horrible. But given that, let's not just throw up our hands and say we're the can't-do country. And because it's harder, let's not even try. Yes, it is harder to eat right on a budget. But I'll tell you something, something you never need to have with your food, soda, which is a large part of it, okay? Huge. And you'll save money. You yeah. don't have to have soda. You don't have to have a Snickers bar. A banana is 19 cents. So it's not impossible. Adele got shit recently because she got yes. skinny. Yes. Because she got healthier. That was also a part of my thing, was <laughs> fit shaming. Yeah, not fat shaming. Yeah. People go, eat something. Eat something. I'm fine. What? So you can feel better about your weight problem. I should eat and get fat too. Well, when heavy people have a fan or have someone that they're a fan of that's also heavy like James Corden like so he's heavy he's got people in the audience that love him and they love him standing up for other heavy people yeah we're fine we're fine he's one of us we're fine I think they felt like that with Adele that Adele was this fantastic singer super talented extremely popular 
and overweight. Like, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. I'm like Adele. Everyone's fine. It wasn't. But then she loses weight. Like, you feel like she's betraying you because one of the reasons why I liked you is because you're fat. Now it, you're not fat anymore. It wasn't that long ago that we were applauding people when they lost weight. Yeah. I remember when, remember when Oprah came out that time where she was... Oh, this was like in the 80s, I think. But she had lost a whole bunch of... Well, there's a picture. You, it's a very famous picture. Yeah. I think she's she's like in jeans and she's got a like really thin waist. And, you know, she was raising her hands in triumph and everyone was applauding. I guess that's bad now because, again, you have to be perfect the way you are. And if you criticize that, then you're a bad person. I th- my take on this is just that there's too many voices that you hear because of social media. You hear so many nonsense voices and they stand out just like everybody else's voice. There's so many people just screaming into the void because there's so many social media accounts. There's so many people that are tweeting about things and Facebooking about things. And, and it gets people confused is that this is like a, a rational perspective. And again, with these right. echo chambers, they're all just hop on board and support James Corden or support, you know, Adele needs to fatten back up. And you'll, you'll get thousands of likes. Everybody will go well, crazy. You, that's the key word. Yeah. That's just what I didn't understand until about a year ago, that so many people are saying things on social media, not because they really believe it, to get the likes. Yeah. Yeah. That's really scary. That's weird. We had a billboard once when we were coming back on the air in January, just like now, about four or five years ago. And the, the tagline was, he's not in it for the likes. And it's my favorite piece of promotion that anyone has ever done for me. That's great. He's not in it for the likes. Yeah. Uh, advertising that as, this is why you watch this show. Yeah. Um, but obviously that's not the way a lot of people feel. They are in it for the likes. And they will take a position that they don't believe in because they know it'll get likes. And I've heard this from people I actually respect. And I'm like, wow, you have an addiction. That is an addiction. Addiction of likes. Addiction, yeah. There is absolutely that. And they calculate their posts based on the kind of response they think it's going to get. It's not like a free expression. It's not like they're they're making a post saying, how do I feel about this thing? Okay, this is a, they're, they're, right. they're writing it down going, how are people going to react to this? How am I going to get right. people to really think that I'm awesome? How am I going to get people to really think I'm progressive, really right. think I'm an open-minded person? Hmm. I feel, hmm. <laughs> the male feminist perspective. Right. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I was just talking to Jimmy, my friend Jimmy Dore about that, about male feminists, about that. That's like a wholly false perspective, and you never see it in gay guys. Like, there are no male feminist gay guys because they're not trying to fuck the women. So it's like the, the, it's not a position they would take. Right. It's it's they'll yeah. they'll support you. They'll be your friend. Right. This whole idea. I'm I'm an right. ally. I mean, like you're trying to fuck, man. It's so clear. It's such an obvious perspective. Right. You know, it's just such a weird, sneaky thing. Yeah. But that's a that's a it's a version of the same thing people are doing for likes on social media. It's a calculated expression in order to get uh you know what what the kind of response you're hoping. You know, it's greasy. It- <laughs> Right? Yeah, that's it's a, greasy. Not the word I would have thought of, but perfect. Whenever yes. I read male feminist posts, I get angry. I just get, I, I just, not that I don't want equality for women. I just, I, you're a greasy man. I know what you, you're doing. Do you read your Twitter? No. Me neither. Never. Because it's why too would toxic. I? Exactly. Ugh. And And what I read about people very often who've killed themselves. Oh, yeah. After you know, reading the responses. That. Yeah, this is a big thing. How about this guy losing his fucking job for saying retard? Couldn't you just yeah. yeah? Couldn't you just stop? Well, he got a job with the Saints. Did he? Oh, <laughs> yeah, so well, he like fine. like he well, went, a great re- which is a player. better team. Yeah. yeah. Oh. But I mean, everybody. I, I, I asked some people who I know, like Barry Weiss, who's like brilliant person, and she's like, "Oh, my, it's like so depressing." My, tw-. it's like, don't read it. Oh yeah, she that came generation on here. cannot stop. Reading, even yeah. when it's going to kill them. I don't understand that. Well, it's it's very impulsive, right? You see your name and you see someone. What do they say? Oh, Barry, you're brilliant. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And then you go a little further. <laughs> yeah. uh, you fucking dumb Died cunt. You. Oh, yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. 
And then there's a bunch of them liking that response, yeah. and then a bunch of people piling on. And right. it's, you got to realize this. Uh, first of all, they don't even know you're a real human. A lot of people have never met anyone famous. They have no. They they, they, they are looking at. And a lot of them are 15. Like when I, I, I always say that if I had a Twitter account when I was 15, I would have said horrible shit to famous people. Right. Just to get a rise. Right. Just to get a react. To see if I can get them to react. It's not even things that they necessarily mean. They don't know you. But, but unless they meet you, they don't even really know you. But that people take it to heart so much that they kill themselves. You know what? A, a few of these K-pop stars have killed themselves. Really? Look that up. From, from K- social media. Yes. I think so. I think that's oh, the main reason. Jesus and and they're And these are, you know, pop stars. Yeah. I can't Top imagine- Bobby Sherman, right. you know, <laughs> in 1968, Elvis. reading his fan mail Imagine and going, Elvis. Ah, this one hates me too. <laughs> if Elvis had a tri- Twitter account, hey man, who the fuck you give a shit? Priscilla's 14. We like each other, man. Yeah. Come on. What the fuck? I ain't a pervert. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> well, maybe he could have used social media back then. That's it, right? That's the balance. Like, you don't want Jerry Lee Lewis marrying his cousin and drowning his wives, and you also don't want Elvis yeah. fucking 14-year-olds. Maybe it'd be better. I, yeah. So maybe a little bit. I maybe often, there's a balance to be achieved. I often wonder what my life would have been like as a teenager with this stuff, because maybe it would have made me kill myself, but I was painfully shy couldn't really talk to a girl if i had been able to text them maybe i think i would say some done, clever shit i exactly ah. i think i could have done really well with that i would have had a lot of dick pictures floating around 100 percent. i would have sent it to everybody well, you fucking hell. dumb and young. You have no. You have no oh. idea that's gonna last forever. I, I thought that was a humble brag about his. No, dick. <laughs> no, it's a regular dick. But it was just any, just any old dick. I'd send dick. people other people's dicks. But I would just think that the whole idea. Yeah, about because young it, boys love dick pic. They draw it and they. Yeah, yeah they're, they're crazy. They're, yeah, like, remember that yeah. scene in what was the fucking movie? Super bad. That was one of my favorite scenes in a movie ever, where he's just drawing dicks in class all yes, day. Yes, exactly. It's fucking hilarious. Yes, because yeah. it's so true. That's so yeah, true. Yeah. yeah. Look, we got real lucky that we are not held up to the standards that kids are today, because everything they do today that they put online, they're going to put a lot of things online. It's permanent forever. I couldn't imagine something that I said when I was 14 being permanent. And, and that points it, me back to this thing about this football player and things that people write on Twitter. It's something that Louis C.K. said to me recently. We were talking about this. He said, people look at stuff when it's written down like it's different, but it's just talk. It's talk, but it's written. Like, people say shit. Oh, she's a fucking bitch. I'm tired of her shit. And then you see her, you're like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, but that's talk, right? But when you see it written, it's like, oh, my God. Did you see what he put on Twitter? Did you see what he wrote? Like, you're talking to the whole world now. Right. And you got to realize this is a different thing. And then people, get a screenshot of it. You can never take it back. You said it. We're going to keep it forever. We're going to archive it. Look, he said it. He said, she's a fucking bitch. And- you can't, there's no just talk anymore, but we're wired for just talk. People are wired for gossip and, and nonsense talk, especially when you're drinking. But if you're drinking and then you get on Twitter, oh, you, you, could, you could say the dumbest shit ever. I, and you could tank your life. And people have. Yeah. Well, Justine Sacco, that famous yes, case. Yes, that was yeah. one of the first ones, the one who was yeah. on as soon as she got off the flight. She, she, her she, life she, was upside down. Right. Yeah. She gets on a <laughs> I mean, it's almost comical, except it's, for her. It's comical. You know, she gets yeah. on a plane and tweets that she thinks something is funny, and then by the time the plane lands, her life's over. By the way, Family Guy did a hysterical version of that, where Brian the dog goes into the theater. He tweets something going into a theater, and it's, it's semi-racist. <laughs> but it's, and then by the time he comes out of the movie, his life is is. It's destroyed by the, the Twitter mob. There's literally a mob outside his house. We're not designed for permanence like that, to, to be able to just express yourself loosely. It's like if you're going to write something in a book and publish that book and you're going to carefully consider every word and then you put that book out and you go, okay, we've gone over it, we've right. edited it. That's it's a different thing than fuck this guy. So what do you think should go on with Louis, Louis C.K.? You mentioned him. Um, I know more about it than most people because I've talked to Louis about it. But what happened versus what's being portrayed is what happened. There were, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's just not true. Like he, he was never and, blocking anybody's door. And, and what's and what's unfair is that he cannot 
say it. He, he can, if you if you engage yeah. and defend yourself They'll and correct the record, then you you make it worse. Yeah. So you're in this sort of purgatory where if you hear things that are not true, you also cannot say anything about it. Yeah. That's a that's an unfair place to be, and also, like, is everything a hanging offense? My problem with some of the Me Too stuff, and of course, I think like every right thinking person, it was a great thing that happened that men have been put on notice that you're playing with five fouls and you just can't get away with a lot of the shit you use. Particular to. men in positions of power yes, in the of office course. place. Right. I mean, I think let's, let's, yeah. let's also extend it to the fracking industry and McDonald's and every other place in America where probably it's very prevalent. Nobody ever hears about it. But there is just no consistency. Charlie Sheen, who I'm not picking on, I like him, but he got a Super Bowl commercial last year. Well, he did way worse things than Louis C.K. Way worse. You couldn't give Louis C.K. A, so people would be like, Louis C.K.'s in a Super Bowl commercial? That is ridiculous. Charlie Sheen. Yeah, like, Charlie Sheen has no shame. And, and I know, but yeah. he held a knife to his... Did he? Uh, didn't uh, that time in Aspen wasn't that the, the, he was with the third wife or something? And I seem to remember. I but he's done. Cra he's being sued yeah. for giving people AIDS. And, yeah. I mean, there's just uh, this litany of things that are way worse yeah. than whacking off in front of people, which is not cool either. Of course, it's. Well, uh, but, but Louis did Louis apologize he... and own up to it, and I just think the. There, where is the consistency? Yeah. Well, like, and also, where is the? Is it a? Is it a? Is everything a life sentence? The, Louis is is a horrible person forever. Right. Or is there some point where we used to go? Yes, a person pays his debt to society in some way, uh, and then, you know, I, you know, you're allowed back. I, I feel. I just feel bad for him. I mean, I feel like he did weird shit that he shouldn't have done for sure. And I think he knows that. I know he knows that. But what is the proper uh, punishment? It, uh, and is, and who decides it? Well, he's definitely working again. So all the yes, people that are but complaining and, and, and bitching about overseas. it. Overseas. No, he's working lot. here. No, yes, he's doing a lot of some, theaters. He's, doing, he's, he's touring again. Right. Yeah. yeah, when you're selling his tickets to his fans. Yeah. Sure. But he certainly can't do everything he wants to do. Right. And he can't. He can still tour, talk. but even if yeah. he wants to do a special, boy, who's going to take him up on that? Right. right? Yeah. You know, who's going to jump jump the line? And maybe maybe the proper punishment is another five years before you can have a special. But oh, that's a long time. Well, I'm just saying. I'm just pulling it out of my ass. I'm just saying. Yeah. What we need some sort of. It's been more than two years. Some now. sort of Me Too court. Yeah. That. <laughs> Will right, hand down right, a fair right. and just a, just a fine Judge Rose McGowan presiding. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. How would you uh, how do you decide when you know a person has been punished enough and w and what is the crime? That's right. Yeah, but he's he's got some hilarious bits about it. He goes, "So the problem was, uh, I like jerking off and I don't like being alone." Right. Like, he's just, <laughs> <laughs> like he opens up yeah. with it. He's right. Got, and I wanted to the rest of the material he does about it, but right. you know. He asked. He asked, can I jerk off in front of you? When they said yes, he did it. It's not a good thing. Nothing's not, good about any of no, it. No. But And he knows it. And no, I'm not defending him. But right. people are portraying it as far worse than – like he went up at Skankfest – in New York, and people went crazy and cheered, and uh, I reposted the video of it. And someone posted on Twitter, one of the rare times I look, fuck you, Joe Rogan, he assaulted women. Yeah, no. I'm like, no, he didn't. No. But he didn't. You are gonna. You can't change what assault means. Right. He asked if he could jerk off in front of people, and then he did. There's some question as to whether or not he jerked off on the phone with somebody. I don't think that's assault either. It's kind of creepy. Not even kind of. It's. I'm sure he would say it's creepy. But- we're not talking about someone who assaulted people. Like you, you can't just change the definitions of the word because right. it makes you feel better about hating someone. Now, I also read, but I don't know if it's true. If his management, I think, um, threatened women who were going to talk about this or prevented someone's career from moving because of this, if that happened, that to me is almost worse. Yes, that's Agreed. really bad stuff. Yes, agree. I don't know if that's true, and. 
he's not allowed to talk to straighten that out. Well, it's not that he's not allowed to talk. Well, it would he's, be. It he's would make considered it talking about it a few times, and I think he just he decides at the end of the day it's just better to just keep pushing ahead. And right. His, and his new hour, apparently, I'm not advertising for it, but it, from everybody that I heard, it's fucking amazing. Because all the pain, oh, and all I'm the craziness, sure. he apparently has a talk about new material, rock and new hour. Right. <laughs> <laughs> talk about something to talk about. <laughs> Do you have to get out of here? Because they said you got two hours. It's about uh, ten. I do, because it's a, like a work night for me. All right. Well, and wrap this, my this first week bad back. boy up. Tell people when is it? Uh, when's the new season air? Uh, Friday. This Friday. Yeah, the seventeenth of January. Um, same bat time, same bat channel, HBO, at uh, ten Eastern. And I guess you can figure out the other time zones from that. And uh, we're gonna go back at it again. Plenty to talk about. Plenty to talk about, always. See? Congratulations, by the way, on making this such a big stop and such an iconic place. You did good. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know what the fuck happened. Just yeah. Stumbled into it. Will you do my show? <laughs> sure. Okay, I asked you before, and you were get, very I, I, squirrely about it. There's so many it. people. They're all talking over each other for They're sound not, bites. You know, I heard you say that once yeah, when you were laughing at some guy doing a terrible impression of me. And <laughs> and it's a very... Kyle Kalinske? He does a great I've, impression of you. I, I, I didn't, didn't know who he was. Have you ever I, seen the face, off, fa- the f- face swap version that he does of you on Instagram? No. Oh, I don't know what Find that, that before we leave. What's that? Kyle, did I say Kalinske? Yeah. Sorry, but sorry, Kyle. No, Kyle we, we, don't, we don't have to look at this. I, I'm, I'm leaving. It's amazing. I, to you, it was amazing. <laughs> I, 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 it wasn't. I, I don't. I, I don't man. I, but people oh. have done me, and I can laugh at but it. It's not that he's it was your just, face. He's got your face, uh, and he's doing an impression of you. You've I never seen this. Did not. Th- I saw what. Anyway, the point. Doesn't matter. Yeah, that doesn't matter. The point was. What was the point? Uh, point was there's not too many people talking over each other on your show. Correct. It feels that's, like it is to me. It's very difficult to have a conversation when there's so many different people talking. That's such a fundamental criticism of my show. It's not is, your show. It's is, just that format. That's the size. The, but the, that's of the that was. I think you're thinking of, of politically incorrect. Was no, that way? No, I'm thinking of your show right now. Uh, well, I, I'm there every week. Okay, and I, trust I you. monitor it pretty closely. Of course, when you have a panel, which we do, there can be those moments, but. We don't book that kind of person and that kind of show. It's not the old let's get them fighting thing. We don't want that. And honestly, the number of times when people have been shouting over each other and you can't hear them is very little. It's not even that they're shouting over each other. It's that if you have a point and you want to talk about something, yeah. you got to let it roll so that's around your hesitation. inside your head. Yeah. But you would be the mid-show guest to my left and it would be a one-on-one. You know, I do a one-on-one twice in okay. the show <laughs> have you seen the show yes, yes okay yes. in the middle of the show yeah i bring out more of a celebrity usually yes. to my left and I was, we I talked the one where one, sam harris started going at it with ben affleck because of that sam was your one-on-one that's right <laughs> okay well that's you know you picked the one example <laughs> where somebody that's what you were talking about i think you've seen one show no of my, i've uh, seen several i uh, saw the one with several. milo oh. i've seen jordan peterson i've okay. seen many, several. many shows th- we've done many over shows. 500 when hitchens I think. Good. Went I just, after, like, i'm glad we got glad we i only i don't demand that anyone be a fan i just like honesty one of my favorite and now we're getting to the honesty christopher hitchens went after most deaf well he's been dead for like 10 years so once again we're, we're establishing your knowledge of this show is very limited. so I've I hope, watched a bunch of episodes. I hope you... You don't have to watch any. I don't need you. But I have. I have lots of fans. I'm not I don't say- need one more. What I'm saying is I'd like you to do it because I think you'd be good and I like listening to you and you'd be to my left one-on-one, there would be nobody shouting over you because they wouldn't be involved. Okay. So you wouldn't have that problem. So will you do it? Yes. Great. All right. And then we'll work Talk on to me and, anyway. Shit. And then we'll work on Hawaii. All right. All right. Bill Marr, ladies and Thank gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Appreciate you being here, man. Thank yeah. You. Real fun. Bye everybody.